Hello, welcome to our final installment of A Communion of Subjects, the Law, Environment, Religion series, which is a joint program of the Yale Schools of Forestry and Environmental Studies, Law, and Divinity. Um, I'm Matt Ampleman. I'm a first-year law student. I'm Lexi Weintraub. I'm a third-year Master's of Environmental Management student at the School of Forestry. Through this series, we've engaged with six leaders at the intersection of these disciplines, and today we're very excited to continue this discussion with Thomas Lovejoy, Professor of Environmental Studies at George Mason University. In his early career, Professor Lovejoy established biodiversity as a fundamental concept in the ecological sciences and as a fundamental priority for conservation. Working in academia and in the nonprofit world, Professor Lovejoy has arguably done more to advance the goal of biodiversity preservation than anyone else in a like position. He has served as the director of the World Wildlife Fund U.S. program, where he helped establish tropical rainforest preservation as a key priority worldwide. He is also the intellectual founder, one of many intellectual founders, of innovative debt for nature swaps, which have opened over a billion dollars of funds for preservation in countries such as Bolivia, Costa Rica, and Ecuador. Professor Lovejoy has served on numerous science advisory positions with government, NGO, and private sector boards. And he has planted the seeds of biodiversity, appreciation, and advocacy in millions of viewers of his critically acclaimed public television program, Nature. Anyone who recognizes the iconic Serengeti acacia tree that marks the logo of that TV show also recognizes the beauty and complexity that you have helped us to see in the natural world. So we are excited to be discussing your work today. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. And I, just with respect to nature, uh, the series that is, uh, the fact that it is still running and so successful after 33 years is actually a very hopeful sign about public interest. Absolutely. There's a, a lot of demand for what you all have yeah. been creating. Um, now, you're the first of the scientists that we've hosted um, and that we've had the chance to talk to on this program. So I want to ask you briefly about your dissertation work, uh, but in conjunction with an ongoing conversation we've had about place, the importance of place in this class. I'm wondering if you can just describe for us the rainforest in Belém, Brazil, where you did your dissertation work, and what that meant to you then, and maybe what it means to you now, um, in basic terms or in lofty terms. So, I mean, what a grand adventure for a biologist. Right? Uh, a, a tropical rainforest essentially as big as the 48 states with only one highway right? and only three million people uh, and so rich in different forms of life that there was always something new every day you went out. Uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, and I just looked at the number of kinds of species of birds and how they related to the numbers and kinds of species of trees and three different kinds of forests and uh, nobody had been able to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just imagine just the abundance of species that you, that you came across. Well, were you familiar with most of those through your studies before you came to see them yourself? or was it sort of an active process of learning? So, so it, it was so long ago that there were no field guides. Uh, so I literally had to make my own field guide uh -huh. up at the Peabody Museum. <laughs> and I got out all the specimens of all the species of birds, that hundreds, that were known from that part of the Amazon. And I took Polaroid photographs wow. and put them in a notebook and turned it into a field guide. Wow. And there were no English names, you know, it was just Latin names. Anyway, it was fun. You're a pioneer in a way in that effort. Well, you know, it's part of having an adventure. Yeah, <laughs> that's so exciting. Um, when you gave your uh, Blue Planet lecture prize, or prize lecture, uh, you talked briefly about the emergence of land plants and modern flowering plants as a key moment in the global Earth uh, atmospheric balance because they drew out so much CO2 from the atmosphere. And you went on to say, 
Um, this was not just the product of photosynthesis converting CO2 into plant material. It also involved the creation of soil and the work of myriad soil organisms. It was a virtual biodiversity symphony. That's beautiful language, and um, it's a pleasure to hear it and to read it. Uh, what I hear from that uh, when I do read it is an attention to the compositional art of the natural world. Um, the ear of your person is attuned to that music in a way that you allow us to hear it as well. And so I'm wondering if you can comment on what, what do you think the elements of that symphony are as, as you perceive them, or um, to put it another way, do you have um, an artistic vision or an aesthetic that drives your excitement in the natural world and that maybe helps you to do the science that you've done? So, so I chose that phrase to mm -hmm. sort of convey that this wasn't done, you know, just by planting wall to wall, I don't know, eucalyptus trees, uh, that it was actually done by all kinds of species, all playing different kinds of roles, and that over, you know, tens of millions of years it actually drew down amazingly high levels of carbon dioxide to pre-industrial levels as though there was some sort of set point in the Earth system. Uh, we don't know that that is in fact the case, but that's what happened. Right? Uh, but but when, I, when I look at nature, I am always astounded by just the sheer variety of it. Uh, things performing roles that we are only just discovering uh, that can turn out to be useful or not, and when they don't turn out to be useful, it's just because we don't know enough right now. Mm -hmm. uh, could well be useful and practical in the future. Uh, and, you know, for the last 10,000 years, you know, it's been a really stable climate. And so all these relationships have gotten that much more finely tuned. Uh, and that's what we're busy upsetting at the moment. So. Um, do you think that uh, there's, a, there's a value to the variety, the amazing variety that you talked about, independent of the use that is also um, inherent to those things, but which we maybe haven't discovered? Like well, uh, you know, to me, just the, the variety of life on Earth mm -hmm. uh, or the variety of as I was saying to Mary Evelyn earlier, the, the variety of freshwater mollusks in the Northeast United States is a wondrous thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how they fit into their actual communities and interact. And, uh, it's not just a bunch of objects like a dead Natural History Museum collection. It's actually almost organismic in the way they relate to each other. Uh, so it's exciting and it's wondrous. I can definitely agree. So you have had a, uh, a long and varied career uh, and I'm wondering if we can go back to sort of the, the early days. You finished here at Yale with your PhD in 1971. Um, and coming out of graduate school, sort of rather than, uh, than staying on a traditional research track, you really dove into uh, working on how do we preserve the biodiversity that, uh, that you had talked so much about, you know, that had become evident the level of loss uh, during the work on your dissertation. And so I'm curious, particularly uh, here in a room full of students who are about to graduate and take those first steps. Um, you know, you really came, went off in a direction of, you know, this new field of conservation biology, which you helped to uh, create. Um, what were those first steps like, you know, as you look so, back? So, I mean, the, the truth is, I really made it up as I went. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and I was, basically, I was mostly interested in just having scientific adventures and going to really exotic places like the mountaintops in East Africa uh, with the montane forests, and then I got a chance to go to the Amazon. Uh, 
And then I was looking for a job and heard about a program, a project administrator job at the World Wildlife Fund US, employee number 13. Uh, and that sort of resonated with a lot of things I had learned from my mentors over time. And I thought I'd go for two years and then go back on the science adventure track. But I didn't, <laughs> uh, because I began to understand how incredibly important it was, how intrinsically fascinating it was, uh, that you actually needed to build a science to pursue conservation, uh, which is why, together with Michael Soule and some others, you know, we created conservation biology. Uh, and so I ended up staying 14 years. And the challenges, you know, just became greater and more complex and more fascinating. And there was also, you know, the opportunity to actually make a difference. Uh, and we did. So, you know, when I started, Costa Rica had only three national parks. And the president, Daniel Odebear, was about to either get rid of one or cut it in half to uh, do something for uh, a friend of his. Uh, and really because of the World Wildlife Fund and some key people in Costa Rica, including the head of the national parks, uh, and the widow of the famous Don Pepe, who got rid of the army in Costa Rica, uh, we were able to turn that around. So in the end, Daniel Odebear became the first super green president of Costa Rica, and it just built from that ever since. And that's, you know, Costa Rica's image. They haven't fallen into the mistake uh, that's happened to us of it becoming a partisan issue. And how evident was it as you started down that path that you were making progress that uh, these changes would come? What did it, what did it look like from the, from the beginning, from your perspective? So, I mean, as I said recently, you know, when I started in, in this game, conservation was something you did because it was nice and because it was right. Uh, but today it's essential. I mean, we really have to manage the planet as a living planet, as a linked biological and physical system. Uh, and that means paying a lot of attention to the big global cycles of carbon and nitrogen and the role of forests and how we abuse or change how we use uh, nitrogen fertilizers. And the list is long and you know them all. But So in 1982, you joined the team at Nature and uh, were part of creating the show and the PBS series, which as you mentioned is now in its 33rd season, which is That's incredible. Right. Um, uh, so the, the Nature website says, uh, over the years, nature has brought the beauty and wonder of the natural world into American homes. Um, I found that choice of emphasizing beauty and wonder uh, is interesting, and I'm wondering, was that uh, part of the initial intention of that show? That's a good um, question. And if so, why? So, so it started because I felt that World Wildlife Fund could only get so far if there wasn't more public awareness. Uh, and at that point, there basically wasn't much on television. There were Marlon Perkins reruns and an occasional Nas National Geographic special, and that was it. Uh, so Scott McVeigh arranged uh, for the two of us to go see Channel 13 in New York, and we showed a BBC film on the Monteverde Cloud Forest. Uh, where at the beginning the trees are falling down and you think, oh, they put the film in backwards. Well, actually, they are running it backwards. Uh, and it's, it's really hard to put one of these back together again. Uh, and then the next hour is uh, about the wonders of cloud forests. Uh, so we didn't have any money. Uh, we couldn't do what we originally, originally wanted to do, which was actually sort of shed some light on the various ways we're degrading the biology of the planet. Uh, and that's probably really great because we fell into this pattern which you just uh, so 
uh, nicely quoted from the, the website, which is to show basically the beauty and wonder of nature and, and just very, you know, quietly say, you know, this is in trouble, right? Uh, and that's why it's still, you know, a series 33 years later. If it had been the hard, punchy thing I was thinking about, it would have died after a year or two, <laughs> right? Well, that just answered my follow-up yeah. question was, you know, looking <laughs> yeah. back after the 30 years yeah. of where we've come, would you make that, uh, would you make that same choice? And it sounds like, uh, yes, you would. I think so. Yeah. And people can only take so much bad news. Mm. And the actual beauty and wonder of it is, you know, in many ways our best ally in convincing people to do the right thing. Do you have any examples or stories of where you've seen it be effective? how you've seen people be influenced by what they've seen or experienced through that show? Well, I'm not thinking so much about that show, but I... Uh, so there was a real turning point in my life uh, that we talked about earlier today when I was with Tim Worth, Al Gore, and John Hines, and Ben Bradley from the Washington Post, and we went to Brazil to see what could be done to be helpful about deforestation and then it turned out it was two weeks after the assassination of the head of the rubber tappers. So the whole trip was a very different kind of trip. Uh, and I'd never done anything like that before. And happily, it was a really good bunch of senators. <laughs> and Tim Worth said to me, don't hold back. And I, because I would have, I would have been intimidated. Right? Uh, but the moment I knew that the trip was a success, was at the very end, and it, we didn't go into the forest until the last afternoon uh, and night of the trip. Uh, and as we went into the camp, I saw Teresa Hines get fascinated with a termite nest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's when I knew the trip was a success, because that actually is what it was all about. Uh, and so, Nature is in so many ways our best ally. So that's why I take people to my camp in the Amazon all the time. I want to continue on that line. You've been so successful with both the TV program and your role at the World Wildlife Fund. Um, I'm wondering, um, I mean, what can you attribute that success to? You've talked a little bit about that. I'm also wondering what you see as the differences in the conservation NGO world now as compared to then. Um, can you still make the same sort of impact that you have been able to make with the World Wildlife Fund? Or other factors, is there too much competition between these various groups? Or other other factors that are in play? Well, when you're in the beginning of something, uh, anything you can do is a plus, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, institutional considerations become less important. Uh, so literally in our first year at the World Wildlife Fund, we gave a grant to the Nature Conservancy to start the international program. Mm -hmm. We gave a grant to uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council to start an international program, and one to the Environmental Defense Fund to start their wildlife program. Mm -hmm which Michael Bean led brilliantly for many years. Uh, that's not the kind of behavior that one would do today, uh, I don't think, or maybe under exceptional circumstances. Uh, but the fact that, you know, all those organizations are much larger today uh, is probably a good thing. It's just that I see the second law of thermodynamics mm. in the way institutions behave. Mm. Mm. And the bigger and more complicated they are, the more energy it takes to actually get anything done. Mm. It's always been the most depressing law in <laughs> physics, hasn't it been? Um, I'm going to bring this maybe to a more philosophical question. Uh, we've entertained some interesting questions in this class about the rights of nature and of non-human animals in conjunction with visits from Linda Sheehan and Paul Waldau. Um, one of the questions, for example, that arises is, do invasive species have a right to thrive in the same way that a native species might? 
Um, as an ecologist, you represent a different perspective on these sorts of philosophical questions. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe your work on integrated landscaping planning, if I'm titling that right, addresses those rights by way of thinking about minimum landscape size and population genetics, um, thinking about what you need to support a species, for example. Um, with those considerations in mind, maybe some of those practical frameworks, do you think that nature has rights, um, maybe from a gut personal level as well? And if so, how do we honor those? Does that question make sense? Well, it's an interesting question, and in fact, it's in the Constitution of Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Maybe imperfectly realized, but it's in the Constitution. Uh, so, I think that since every species has a four billion year pedigree, uh, that w one should really hesitate, hesitate before putting an end to that line of evolution. Uh, and so I, I do think about it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, invasive species are an interesting issue because it's mostly created by our own behavior. Uh, and it can really complicate how one tries to sort of manage the natural ecosystem. Uh, so I'm not one of those people who thinks the fact that Puerto Rico has a lot of introduced species on it that it's actually, you know, like it was 500 years ago. It isn't. Uh, so within certain limits, I think of it just like, you know, weeding a garden, right? You, uh, you want the natural part of it to flourish. Uh, it becomes much more complicated with, with climate change, uh, where species are going to be moving naturally, uh, and where I think the d distinction, if we let it go that far, between invasive species uh, and species tracking their required conditions uh, will really get blurred. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get into questions of assisted migration. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my whole take on climate change is try and keep it to a minimal level that's actually where the consequences are somewhat manageable. Uh, and the two degree target that the nations of the world have agreed on is not manageable. Uh, it, it has no intrinsic merit. It was simply chosen because people thought it was doable. Uh, and, you know, biology aside, you know, the last time the planet was two degrees warmer, the oceans were four to six meters higher. I mean, do you need to know anything more? I mean, I don't think you do, right? Uh, so, uh, I think that was an okay response. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, there, are, there are so many questions that, that come up uh, with respect to climate change and, and management. Um, I think I want to speak about the um, National Park Service Management Plan um, that you mentioned, uh, or the revision of it that you mentioned uh, in a lecture here in June 2013. Uh, you told us how um, Starker Leopold's um, management plan was being revised and how the vignette of primitive America meant to be preserved by the national parks would have to sort of transition to a moving picture when we think about the mm -hmm. boundaries of mm -hmm. protected areas. And I'm wondering, um, in the context of uh, our legal framework surrounding property and land, um, if we need to change those and in maybe what way, uh, do we need to be able to shift property boundaries uh, with shifting uh, plant ranges um, for protected land. Is that the type of change that we might need in law to approach the problems of climate change? Or are there other sorts of legal issues that you think uh, should be raised in this context? So, 
if we were in Canada, yeah. it would be a really serious problem because all the parks in Canada, uh, each one is created for a particular biological reason. Oh, wow. <laughs> and if it's no longer in the park, it, it's an issue. Right. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and we have some like that. Uh, the Joshua Tree National Park is to protect Joshua trees, and they're literally you know, the range is moving out of the park. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think actually what we, we need to do is think on an even bigger scale and think about sort of flipping the current model of <coughs> nature being embedded in a human-dominated matrix to the exact opposite. Uh, where human aspiration is is pursued within a natural matrix, uh, and there's some parts of the world where that's easier to do than others. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do it in India, uh, uh, but one of the things that has really struck me is how much connection gets put back into a landscape if one restores riparian vegetation. Uh, and I learned that because I was sent out to, by Bruce Babbitt to look at the Northwest Forest Plan as it was being developed. Uh, <coughs> and they were trying to decide how wide the strip of untouched forest should be on either side of watercourses uh, because salmon like logs and streams. Uh, and what I got out of it was not just that, it was the immense amount of connection it puts back into the landscape. And it's stuff you mostly want to do anyway. Uh, I mean, it prevents soil erosion, you get better water quality. Uh, you know, I've been in southern Illinois where today most of the farmers do no-till, but because that's only relatively recent, uh, there is so much topsoil that's in the Illinois River that the government spent $16 million to dredge it out and sell it back to the farmers. Uh, so I think a lot of these things begin to be win-win. Uh, the issue is really how one gets from the status quo and people's own vested interests to something that will actually work better for everybody uh, in the end, uh, and it really requires a different mindset. Do you think that political jurisdictions or management jurisdictions need to be more watershed based if you're talking about riparian habitat as an organizing principle? Uh, not only that, I think we have to start managing across those boundaries. Okay. Uh, and that's part of what was sort of being implied in the revisiting Leopold report. Okay. That makes sense. Do you have a question? Yeah, so it's evident from the way that you talk about these systems that uh, you have a real sensitivity and awareness and, uh, and a real connection to the way all of the pieces fit together. Um, and you talk about uh, this idea of managing, consciously managing the globe, consciously managing the earth, right? That in, in this way that we're a part of it and we're uh, recognizing uh, mm -hmm. what systems, species, mm. organisms need. Um, at the same time, uh, conservation scientists who are working internationally in places where uh, they're not from um, and are, you know, working in to conserve areas where there are already people living who may have different ways of uh, knowing, perceiving, valuing systems. Um, sort of how do we reconcile uh, this idea of you know, in, in some ways, conservationists, conservation scientists have, uh, you know, a particular lens and a particular, and access to a particular set of information about the way we might manage landscapes. Um, but how does that bump up against the, say, the agency of indigenous people to manage uh, or make decisions um, uh, on the lands mm -hmm. where they're based? And I know you've done a lot of work down in the Amazon where there, there are a lot of contentious issues around that. If you have any stories or examples or thoughts, that would be great. So, uh, so first of all, I should say, sort of managing the planet as the linked biological and physical system 
sounds unbelievably arrogant. Mm. Uh, but what it really is about is managing ourselves and our behavior. Uh, so I learned pretty quickly uh, that the best way to advance conservation, even if you had the perfect solution in your head, is not to arrive in somebody else's country and say, oh, here's the answer. <laughs> it's go there and really do a lot of listening and have a, a lot of engagement. <clears throat> and so what's so interesting to me about the indigenous people in the Brazilian Amazon is when I was first working there, uh, the Brazilian government didn't like anybody working with indigenous people. So conservation was a gutsy enough thing in itself, but to, to pair it with indigenous uh, matters would have, would have been the exit door. <laughs> uh, so a lot has changed in Brazil, and uh, their new constitution, which I think is 1988, has really important provisions in there for indigenous people. Uh, and I mean, unbelievably, uh, almost all the indigenous lands of the Brazilian Amazon have been demarcated and the, the, the rights uh, given to the indigenous people. And it's 27% of the Brazilian Amazon. And it was done with German money. You know, so for a country that used to really worry about its sovereignty issues, that was quite amazing. And I think part of the trick there was that the money went through the World Bank. The World Bank managed what was called the G7 program for the Brazilian rainforests. Uh, and I can't resist telling you, I, I once had dinner with President and Ruth Cardozo to try and persuade Brazil to be the leader for sustainability within the Amazon Pact, which he got in like 60 seconds. But we were doing small talk beforehand, and he's, he's asking me about the G7 program, and I said, well, you know, there's this really remarkable thing about the indigenous areas, and then uh, Fernando Enrique and Ruth started talking about it at a level of detail I couldn't possibly match. And we ended up, we were talking about the then contentious issue about the Yanomami Indians up in Roraima, where the local settlers didn't want the Yanomami to have one big area. They wanted to have a bunch of little islands where they happened to be at the moment. Uh, and Ruth Cardozo said, well, I'm in favor of the largest possible area. It's good for the forest. It's good for the Indians. So uh, one of the really important things in Brazil was the effect of hosting the Earth Summit uh, that raised public consciousness there to an unbelievable level. So uh, one of our previous speakers in this course uh, was James Anaya, uh, so a special reporter on indigenous rights. Um, and, and he would argue that uh, an indigenous group needs to have agency over uh, those choices of what needs to happen with the land. So you know, if that comes into conflict with conservation goals, uh, you know, so be it. What would you sort of say to uh, say to that, or how would you so, sort of guide that process? So, so I've, you know, a long ago I figured out that uh, it would be the height of arrogance to think of these indigenous areas uh, as sort of places where the indigenous people lived according to their culture frozen in time. Right? And that's, that's not going to be the case. Uh, and it shouldn't be the case. Uh, I think the issue is about rate of change. Uh, and the issue can also be about what kinds of change. Uh, and it's perfectly reasonable to engage in conversations around that. And, and there are NGOs that do that, I think, very well. You know, and then they start by giving the indigenous people uh, their GPS uh, technology and the, the 
indigenous group sort of maps its own land and for the first time has an even better understanding than they did before and so it's got to be an ongoing exercise. So uh, if we can shift and talk a bit about your own sort of cosmology, I know this, uh, this course is titled The Communion of Subjects drawn from Thomas Berry, mm -hmm. I know you've, uh, you've read and whose work you've yeah. endorsed. Um, so I'd like to read a passage of his from the new story uh, and have you okay. comment if you would. Uh, so the impasse of the secular scientific community committed to a developmental universe is the commitment to the realm of the physical to the exclusion of the spiritual. Uh, the Darwinian principle of natural selection involves no psychic or conscious purpose, but is instead a struggle for earthly survival that gives to the world its variety of form and function. Because this story presents the universe as a random sequence of physical and biological interactions with no inherent meaning, the society supported by this vision has no adequate way of identifying any spiritual or moral values. An integral story has not emerged and no community can exist without a unifying story. He says the most notable single development within science in recent years, however, has been a growing awareness of the integral physical psychic dimension of reality. So I wonder what you think uh, of this idea of uh, the universe as a psychic or conscious uh, entity. So uh, it's a really good question. Uh, and I don't know, I can give you even a halfway decent answer. Uh, but to begin with, it's sentient. Right. Uh, and I am always struck by how any child is immediately drawn to any kind of living thing that has eyes. And they're, they're, you just sort of, something's gonna, gotta be going on inside there, right? Uh, so I, I think we're actually, through our own evolution, uh, normally quite able to appreciate that aspect of nature. It's just when we get really engaged in our own social primate uh, organizations and tribes and whatever that we tend to forget that we're connected to all of that. Uh, but I also, I've also uh, always had a very healthy respect for other people's belief systems. Uh, and I think it's perfectly possible uh, and reasonable and maybe even desirable uh, to, in the same individual, have a value system uh, that thinks about uh, the larger questions of how we fit into the universe uh, and values uh, at the same time as being an actual scientific mind. And, you know, even, even Darwin did that. He was conflicted, he was deeply conflicted. Uh, he was both of those in the same individual. Mm, so would you, uh, would you agree that there's, uh, that both our, it, it sort of suggests that, hey, there's this tension between uh, our religious worldview and the scientific worldview, that it's hard for both the spiritual and this sort of physical biological system, that the stories for each of those to really cohere and resonate uh, in a holistic way. Um, would you agree that coming from, you know, as coming from the scientific community, this uh, view of the world as a biological, physical entity that lacks uh, sort of this spiritual or self-reflexive, conscious uh, sort of way of knowing itself, that that, uh, that, that view is problematic, that that view maybe doesn't allow us to uh, uh, make the changes culturally, socially, that we would need to uh, sort of correct the path that we're on. So I'm not sure that really is the case, uh, because if you start with the premise that no organism can exist without affecting other organisms. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's not whether you do that or not. It's it's how you do it in what way in what ways, uh, and that by nef definition I think has to include a value system. Right? So uh, I think it's it's more than appropriate, if not essential, that we all try and think in both those ways. I love that, and I love. Um, the focus on sentience that you were discussing earlier. Um, I also like thinking of the scientific community as an essential part of the sort of global human sentience and awareness of our environment. Um, and um, yeah, in, in the process of discovery, in the process of discovery as individual scientists and as, as a species. And, so I want to come back to science a little bit um, and uh, the sense of discovery surrounding that. Uh, I'm going to read a section of your abstract from the 2011 Biological Conservation article that you wrote uh, with William Lawrence and many others. And, and then I'm going to ask a question, uh, and okay. I'll promise I'll ask the question. Um, uh, in general, populations and communities of species and fragments are hyperdynamic relative to nearby intact forests. Some edge and fragment isolation effects have declined with a partial recovery of secondary forests around fragments, but other changes, such as altered patterns of tree recruitment, are ongoing. Fragments are highly sensitive to external vicissitudes, and even small changes in local land management practices may drive fragmented ecosystems in markedly different directions. These effects are likely to interact synergistically with other anthropogenic effects such as logging, hunting, and especially fire, creating an even greater peril for the Amazonian biota. Peril notwithstanding, that's an exciting piece of text in my opinion. Um, I was excited when I was reading it. Um, it has a decadal view of the landscape, at least decadal, um, and it encompasses uh, many variations and possible contingencies. Um, I'm wondering if that uh, dynamism that I see in the text itself um, and in the landscape that's described in the text. I'm wondering if that is um, a key component of your process and your reason for doing science or if it's just a way of catching people's attention. Um, and if you'll exclude, uh, excuse me, excuse the lofty language, can we treat in some ways, the abstract as uh, a poem, which is transformative both for the reader of it, but also for the doer of it, the person who writes the abstract and who did the science and who made the discovery. Is that uh, one of your reasons for doing science? Because it's transformative when you learn about the world around you. Or is there another reason? So why do I do science? I do, I do science because it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but I do particular kinds of science because I think it can help us make better decisions about mm -hmm. how we relate to the world. Uh, and what is <clears throat> particularly interesting, given that choice of what you just read, uh, is I thought a lot about why habitat fragmentation wasn't even considered an issue when I was mm -hmm. in graduate school. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, it's, I think it's because you don't see the changes right away. Mm -hmm. You have to be doing science like that paper is referring to, mm -hmm. to actually see what is actually considerable change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you don't, you don't just go out in the landscape and see it happening. Uh, and it's interesting to me, I think, if you go back and look at the work of Ruth Patrick, who figured out that the numbers and kinds of species in a river give you a readout on its natural conditions plus the stresses in the human landscape, uh, that that then led to a whole series of papers uh, around species diversity. And, you know, my thesis was one of those. Uh, but. You know, MacArthur was really interested in that question, and Wilson, uh, and then they did the theory of island biogeography, and all of a sudden, the question was there, are isolated bits of forest in a human-dominated landscape like islands? 
and will species number be deeply affected by different things? Uh, and then people started studying it, and yeah, it is amazingly dynamic. And it is, it is a major way we are changing the biology of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I started out to do the Forest Fragments uh, project as a 20-year project to answer a simple question. Now, should it be a big protected area or a bunch of small ones? Uh, and I had no ideas about rates of change, and we're now in year 36, uh, and it's still changing. Uh, and it's going to be institutionalized so people can look at it 100 years from now or whatever. Because uh, we really need to understand these things if we're to manage the place in any reasonable way. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, so impressed by the vision of being able to incorporate um, natural history or transition natural history into the accepted science of biological conservation that the group of individuals, um, including you, ha were able to do at that time. Was that something that you intentionally um, set out to do to sort of establish um, natural history as a legitimate science in conjunction with biology or in the form of biological conservation. So, so you have to understand that the person who really transformed natural history into a science was G. Evelyn Hutchinson, okay. who was my thesis yeah. advisor. Yeah. Um, and he cared about conservation as did many others. <coughs> so it was it was just a logical thing for me when I got to the World Wildlife Fund to start thinking, what are the science questions we have to address? Mm -hmm. We're going to do this in a successful way. Mm -hmm. And then one thing leads to another. Um, well, we're all indebted to you for that, yeah, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, I'm going to quote you again, this time from your Blue Planet lecture. Um, species are changing where they occur. Uh, I'll paraphrase you. The Edith checker spot butterfly one of the two most studied species, butterfly species in North America, has clearly been moving northward and upward. You talked about Joshua trees moving out of Joshua mm -hmm. Tree National Park. Um, and you also talk in that lecture about uh, ponderosa pines moving um, up elevation. Uh, and the sense that I come away with when reading that text is that this is a great migration that we're experiencing right now. It's not a migration in any one particular direction, but it's an epic that um, somebody uh, needs to tell us about. Uh, and you are one of the few people that have been able to reach the multitudes in part through your television program, but also by working with uh, policy leaders mm -hmm. at the top of um, governments all across the earth. And so I'm wondering, um, as you continue to tell that um, epic, how are you making sure that others take up that scroll? Or maybe, um, maybe what what is your vision? If you could write the next um, chapter in in that new story, uh, if we want to use the language of Thomas Berry, uh, what would the storyline be? Um, is so, so here's my ideal mm -hmm. next chapter. Okay, right. and maybe a whole bunch of chapters. <coughs> it's, it's when we all, scientists and non-scientists uh, and uh, value leaders alike, get beyond thinking about calling the current uh, time on Earth the Anthropocene because of the human mm -hmm. impact on it. And and actually earn the right to call it the Anthropocene because we have gotten control of our own behavior mm. and are bringing this back into some kind of equilibrium. That's fascinating. Um, we've had other discussions about the Anthropocene in this class, but I, I love that vision of where we are now and where, where we should be. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's been, been a great It's been be a real here. pleasure. Thank you. Great questions.